And now I'd like to introduce today's special guest. In a few minutes, Equal Voice will present the Eve Award to one of Canada's truly great women, Frances Langkin. Frances is a remarkable person, a person fully engaged in her community, a trailblazer and role model for all women in Can Canadian public life. Frances Langkin started out as a prison guard and moved into a senior leadership position in the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, becoming a strong voice within the labour movement. She was elected to Queen's Park as a new Democrat in 1990 and was immediately appointed to Bob Ray's cabinet as the first ever new Democratic government in Ontario. She served as Minister of Government Services, Chair of the Management Board of Cabinet, Minister of Health, and Minister of Economic Development and Trade. She is remembered by colleagues and opponents alike as a highly effective and intelligent minister. Frances also spent 11 years as the MPP for Beaches East York. Since 2001, she has successfully led United Way's uh, ambitious transformation to become a leading community-building organization in this city. Over the past years, under Frances's leadership, the United Way has set new fundraising records at a time when more and more residents of Toronto require assistance. She has also served as the Ontario Workers' Compensation on the uh, Ontario Workers' Compensation Tribunal, co-founded the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, and was a spokeswoman for the Equal Pay Coalition, seeking pay equity between women and men. She has been awarded the Queen's Jubilee Medal, and this year the Canadian Public Relations Society pre presented Frances with a CEO Award of Excellence in Public Relations. Frances has had an outstanding career. In and out of elected office, she has also worked to engage more women in leadership positions, promoting policies affecting women's equality, including childcare, workplace harassment, and employment equity initiatives. Frances Lankin's compassion, her devotion to social justice, and her intelligence and energy have all helped Torontonians envision a better and brighter future for our city. She is a vital member of our community and a worthy recipient of the Eve Award. Please join me in welcoming to the podium today our very special guest speaker, the President and CEO of United Way of Greater Toronto, Francis Lankin. Very much. Okay, those of you who uh, spend a lot of time with me at United Way know it doesn't take much to make me cry, <laughs> and you did it. Um, sorry for that. Uh, thank you for that lovely, <laughs> lovely introduction. I was chuckling to myself when you launched into the story about me being a, a former prison guard and, and a, uh, working for the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, both proud parts of my history. But it made me think about the very first time that I ran for political office, and uh, it was getting down to the last week or so before the election, and uh, the Toronto Star was running a series of just little, you know, bio pieces on, on candidates in certain races uh, in, in the city. And, uh, hi, Laurie. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we were, you know, canvassing really hard and, and out there working, and I, and I think, you know, I was, I was in a little bit of a, a sort of state of amazement because you know, things were going really well, and I couldn't quite believe it. It wasn't quite real to me at that point in time. But I was out canvassing this one afternoon, and I went down a whole street of houses, and people seemed to be home that afternoon. And everyone was going, hi, Francis, as I was coming up the sidewalk. And they were saying, we're going to support you. We'll take one of your signs. You know, house after house after house. That's actually not a normal experience for most candidates <laughs> anywhere. And I thought, like, wow, is this ever amazing? And I was coming down from one porch, and there was uh, at the at the foot of the sidewalk uh, a gentleman, obviously a reporter. I could, you know, I could tell. And he introduced himself to me, and it was Tom Wacom. I didn't know Tom Wacom in those days, and uh, he was out just doing, a, you know, the little tidbit piece for the riding of Beaches Woodbine. And uh, he had gone to the campaign office, and my campaign manager, 
I didn't carry a cell phone or anything, you know, just sent them on down. She knew that I was in a good poll and that it would be okay. Now, I almost had a heart attack because I had just had 10 houses take signs and I was quite sure no one else would for the rest of the block, you know, odds, odds would be. Uh, anyways, Tom accompanied me to the doorstep and it was the same reception uh, door after door after door. It really had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the sweep and politics that was taking place in the province, but I felt pretty good. I thought this little story in the Toronto Star is just going to be one heck of a story about this new kid on the block coming in and uh, how the riding was, uh, was going to uh, remain, because it had been, remain with the uh, New Democratic Party. And so the next day, when the little tidbit's in there, most of the story actually focused on my, um, my liberal uh, opponent, um, Beryl. Do you remember Beryl back in those days? Yeah. And uh, there was a, a one-liner about me. It was kind of like the also ran, but also running for the New Democratic Party, Francis Lankin, former jail guard and union negotiator. <laughs> I had been involved in, you know, the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, the Pay Equity Coalition, like a community activists. Like, I had lots of things on my resume, but there I was branded a uh, former jail guard and union negotiator, and that has remained with me through all of my introductions at this point in, in time. But as I said, you know, proud moments in my history, too. Um, I, I want to thank you so much. Uh, obviously, you can tell that I'm very moved um, by this recognition. This is so very, very special. It is a, an honor to be here, and it is a, a humbling honor um, for sure. I can't tell you how much it means to me to stand among such uh, distinguished recipients, women that I have long admired, uh, Carolyn Bennett and uh, Flora McDonald and Hazel McCallion. Each one of them so accomplished each have done so much to advance women in a field that you and I both know is a very challenging field. And each of them is a great role model for women looking to enter politics. Any woman who has entered the arena of politics and achieved success knows that it can be difficult. They also understand how important it is to continue the work of organizing women, supporting and encouraging them to enter politics. As many of you know, I've had a bit of a, a history with Equal Voice and with its predecessor organization, the Committee for 94. This has been a bit of a passion of mine for a number of years. But I have to tell you that Equal Voice, in my opinion, is one of the most important organizations in our country. Championing the advancement of women in politics is a critical task, and all too often it's a thankful one. So words can't express the, uh, the depth of feeling I have for all of you and the work that you do on behalf of women. And so I want to say um, to you all very much from the bottom of my heart, um, thank you for the work that you keep on doing. It's very important. So as I said, I feel pretty passionate about the subject of, of women in politics. It's also one of those subjects where sometimes I feel a bit conflicted as well. On one hand, I look at how far women have come. I mean, it's no longer innovative or forward-looking to have strong women in government cabinet positions. Uh, it's almost a requirement for any government now uh, if they're going to be considered to be relevant. However, I know that women still face many barriers in the political arena. Now, to be fair, a lot has changed. Looking at the federal political scene for a moment, in 1921, the percentage of women elected to the federal political office was it, are you ready for this? 0.4%. Her name was Agnes McPhail. <laughs> Agnes, of course, was the first woman ever elected to federal office in Canada. Uh, and then the number of women elected to political office remained below 3% from 1921 until 1980. That's 59 years. It reached 13% in 1988 and it has stayed around the 20-21% 20, since 1993. So I guess you have to say that compared to where we were at at the beginning of the last century, women have gained a lot of ground. But at the pace we're moving, it's going to take another century to reach equitable representation. Women make up more than half the population of Canada, and yet our representation remains at around the 20%. Clearly, there's a lot of work yet to do. Now, it was seven years ago when I announced that I was leaving elected politics. I had been at Queen's Park for 11 years at that point. I had spent the two decades before that in the back rooms of, of politics. 
I saw a lot of progress over those years. Um, I had the great uh, opportunity to work with other women to bring affirmative action measures to ensure greater, greater elected representation in the labor movement and in the Ontario New Democratic Party. Uh, it was in 1989 that Marianne Bryden, the then sitting MPP in the riding of Beaches Woodbine, um, she's another trailblazer blazer for women um, as well, she called me up and asked me to come over and, and have a coffee. Uh, I sat down and uh, I had no idea what she wanted to talk to me about and she proceeded to tell me that uh, she'd had a long good run and she'd really enjoyed her political career but she was intending to retire. And she wanted to encourage me to consider seeking the nomination. She was opening the door, taking a younger woman by the hand and encouraging her to step over the threshold. In September of 1990, I was elected as part of the Bob Ray government in October, I was one of 11 women sworn into cabinet. It was a historic moment, the most women ever appointed to cabinet. I was proud of Bob's commitment and the commitment of the New Democratic Party to women's leadership. There was a critical mass of women in cabinet and it made a difference. I remember the day that we heard that the Morgenthaler Clinic had been bombed. I was the Minister of Health and Marion Boyd was the Attorney General. We met. We then went to meet with the Premier's office and with their support we called a press conference for the next morning. We announced that our government was not going to allow such an act to stop women from accessing a legal health service. We would move and reopen the clinic. We would provide funding for security for that clinic and other clinics and seek an Attorney General's restraining order to keep protesters at a distance from the clinics to stop the verbal and physical harassment of patients and staff. Women's leadership made a difference. I remember when the economy was suffering in a North American recession and the government was introducing a job creation program. Now, it was to be a traditional uh, infrastructure jobs program. That's a traditional program that would create traditional construction jobs and as you know those are traditionally male jobs. Well, Evelyn Gigantis, with the support of others of us at the cabinet table, argued that we had to be sure that women benefited from this important government investment as well. And the program was added to to ensure just that. Women's leadership made a difference. I remember when the government was creating the Judicial Appointments Committee and together, the women of Cabinet um, stood up to make sure that women were going to get a fair chance at being appointed to the ju judiciary. Uh, Bob made a, a very bold move at that point in time and appointed Judy Rebick to a member of the Appointments uh, Committee, and she did her job well. But I have to say that in the legislature, women overall were still a minority. The tone, uh, the raucous, testosterone-charged atmosphere hadn't changed. <coughs> Excuse me. I remember when we thought we could change it. I remember when women from uh, all three political parties came together, and I see some of them here. I'm looking at Eleanor across, across the hall there, and uh, there were a number of women in this room that were part of that. Uh, we were trying to figure out how we could have an impact. We tried. I have to say we made little progress. Uh, and over time, our behavior deteriorated as well. Okay. Well, there weren't enough of us. <laughs> there were moments, though. I remember when allegations surfaced that two women corrections employees had been sexually assaulted by male corrections staff at a, a training program they were attending. The third party's corrections critic was on a roll. He was calling for the resignation of our corrections minister. Excuse me. You know, it was a, <clears throat> it was a terrible thing that had happened and I could, I could only imagine how those two women felt about this also now being a political issue uh, that was you know, going to be covered in the newspaper and everything. Uh, so I understood, however, that in the world of, of cut and thrust of partisan politics that um, this would be an issue that the opposition critic really you know, was going to go for and he was, he was going for the jugular. But he was using sensationalist, um, evocative, and disturbingly descriptive language 
Uh, and the media were just lapping it up. I mean, I was in shock. <clears throat> I looked around at all sides of the house, and I saw that other women were upset too, and I got angry. The place was in chaos. Uh, the speaker called a recess, and I marched over to the opposition lobby and pulled Diane Cunningham aside. I told her what I knew to be true. There were survivors of sexual assault that were sitting as members in that legislature. <clears throat> and the approach that her party was condoning was hurtful and just wrong. Diane nodded, told me to stay where I was, brought the critic over to me and said, tell him what you just told me. I did. He paled. He had never thought about that possibility. He was shaken. He apologized. To his credit, while he continued his attack and he did his job very well, it was with a very different tone. And I've always had a soft spot in my heart for him since that time. But there's a lesson there. Sometimes it's just up to us to speak up. I remember many times in opposition as well, working with women in the Harris cabinet. Uh, when Janet uh, was Minister of Education, we worked quietly on into the late night one time, trying to find a win-win solution for an impending uh, QP strike with the Toronto District School Board. We came up with what we thought was a face saver all around that would serve the public interests and that would move things forward. Uh, we thought we had a real winning plan. We didn't succeed though. Um, the Minister of Labour didn't support us. He didn't like our solution. <laughs> Uh, or when Elizabeth Whitmer, as Minister of Health, helped me gain government support for my private member's bill regulating the use of restraints for elderly patients, much as I had done a number of years before as Minister of Health for Diane Cunningham's private member's bill mandating the use of bicycle helmets after her son's traumatic accident. I entered politics because I know women make a difference. And I entered politics because of the many dynamic and incredible women who broke ground for all of us, all of those of us who have followed. They stood up passionately for what they believed, they represented the best of their generation, and they shone as real examples of the very change that they were working towards in society. Because of them, the barriers we face are a little less tall and our opportunities a little greater. Their determination, like light shining in the dark, enable of those of us who come after them to see a little farther down the road. Women like Agnes McPhail, who early in the last century fought for the right of women to participate in politics. The first woman ever elected to the House of Commons and one of the first women elected to sit in the Ontario legislature. And women like Rosemary Brown, the first black woman elected to a provincial legislature in BC and one of the most passionate advocates for progressive change in our country's history. I'm proud of the fact that when I had the chance to represent my local community, I shared a riding with my um, colleague next door, Marilyn Shirley, who's here today as well. And in part of our riding, it was the area that uh, the very same community and the very same political party uh, represented by Agnes McPhail so many years before. I was very conscious of this fact, and I felt a great responsibility to live up to the standard that McPhail had set. These and other women were true pioneers. They stood against immense odds and they made a difference in the lives of all of us. We have a lot of work to do yet to ensure that women's voice are heard in the provincial and national level of this country. Because we know that when women take a strong and active role in the economic, social and political life of our community, our communities become better places for everyone. We know that women make choices to enter politics for different reasons than men. And the issues that affect their choices are very different too. Issues such as poverty, lack of affordable childcare, domestic violence, workplace equity. In my time in politics, I learned an important lesson about government. It can't solve every problem. But there are few real social problems that can be fixed without the participation in government as a significant partner in addressing them. I also learned that women bring a very important perspective to government. More women in elected positions will mean very different perspectives on our priorities. And hopefully when we reach that elusive, it seems, tipping point in terms of women in office, 
we will see a significant shift in public policy approaches to some of our longer-term challenges. But the most important lesson I learned is that there is a rich and meaningful life after politics. Some people stay just too long. Not you, Hazel. Not talking about you. <laughs> I, uh, I feel incredibly fortunate that following the opportunity to serve the province of Ontario as an elected uh, representative and as a cabinet minister, I now have the honor of heading what I consider to be one of the finest organizations serving the people of, of Toronto. I am completely nonpartisan these days, but United Way has given me the opportunity to continue to serve the community. Politics can place a, a very heavy emphasis on partisanship. Now the sharp contrast between competing ideas on how to best manage government and address problems is an important part of our democratic system. It could be a little less bitter, though, and a little more productive, I believe. Politicians could spend more time on the contrast of ideas rather than the trading of insults. Now, I think we'll get there. The public is demanding more accountability from political representatives, and part of that is the demand for better behavior. But I must really say that I enjoy the fact that when I get up in the morning, um, every single day, I'm not going to work thinking about how to catch my opponents off guard or win political points. Um, instead, I go to work thinking about how I'll make a difference in the community, and it's a wonderful experience. In my job, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of great people in our community, and I'd like to introduce you to one of them, um, one of the great people that I've met. There's a young woman here today, uh, Tanika Morgan. Tanika, would you stand up, please, for me? She didn't know I was going to do this. In fact, Tanika, come up here on the stage with me, please. Come on up. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Tanika. I uh, first met Tanika when I was co-chairing the uh, very first Toronto City Summit. And uh, boy, was I ever impressed. Uh, she's smart, she's confident, and she's making a difference in this city. Now, Tanika has gone through her share of tough times in her young life, but she's come through them, and now she's giving back. Tanika works in Jane Finch, and she works with young moms, helping them build a real future for themselves and their kids. Now, I decided, and I told Tanika this, that I, I wanted to help her. I wanted to offer to mentor her, if she, if she wanted that. And so uh, I encouraged her, firstly, to join the board of the Youth Challenge Fund, and she did. Uh, we invited her a couple of years ago to MC part of United Way's campaign kickoff, and she did a fabulous job. She's now a member of United Way's Community Impact Committee, and she's got a lot of other credentials in the community, uh, things that she's working on. I don't know what Tanika will do in the future, but she and young women of her generation are, in fact, our future. I don't know if she'll ever decide that she wants to run for political office, <laughs> but I hope so. <laughs> What I do know is that if each one of us in this room reaches out and teaches out to young women like Tanika, and if we encourage all of our friends to do the same, if we open doors and take their hand and invite them to step across the threshold, there will be a whole host of young leaders ready to take their seats in political office when the time comes. And when our voices are represented in sufficient numbers, it will make a difference. Thank you so very much for this terrific honor. Thank you, Francis. And now I'd like to call on Rosemary Spears, founding chair of Equal Voice, to present the Eve Award. Okay. 
It's my very pleasant role today to present Francis Lankin with our fourth Eve Award. The award is the way the Equal Voice Founders chapter honors trailblazers who advanced our cause of electing more women. Frances is being honored this year for three year reasons. Because she so well demonstrated that a woman can win in politics, because her achievements have made her a role model for others, and because of her early efforts to make it easier for aspiring women to follow in her footsteps. Now, I first encountered Frances about the time Tom Wacom did. I don't think I'd have called her a union negotiator. I'd have called her a union troublemaker, <laughs> which I think is an honorary degree. <laughs> she was then a militant member of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, taking part in an illegal strike of men and women. In fact, I think you put the motion for the strike, didn't you, Francis? <laughs> there are no secrets. <laughs> These were men and women working at the Don Jail who'd walked out for safer conditions. So after that beginning, Frances moved up fast through the labor movement and within the New Democratic Party. And while advancing herself, she also built a reputation for her staunch support of other women's interests. In both arenas, she encouraged other women to stand for office and work to elect them. And I hope you're going to work for Tanika. Mrs. Lankin also helped formulate the NDP's affirmative action policy, which requires local riding associations to ask a woman to be in the running. As a result of this outreach, the NDP regularly nominates more women than any other party. And Francis helped get that policy through convention. Frances has been a source of advice and support for our efforts to raise public awareness about the low number of women in politics. In the 80s, as she mentioned, she was a member of our original committee that demanded half the House by 1994. Six years ago, we started again. She was an equal voice founder who played an encouraging, constructive role at our very first meeting at Libby Burnham's home. Frances has also acted as a member of our rainbow of former women politicians, who work across party lines to advance the cause of women in politics. She's one of those who really gets what it means to be multi-partisan. Frances, we're proud to present you with our EVE Award for your lifelong advocacy for women in public life, and I'd like to ask Donna Dasko, Chair of the Founders Chapter, to step up here and make the presentation. The 2008 EVE Award goes to Frances Lankin for outstanding contributions for fairer representation for women. Now I'd like to call on Noella Milne to thank Francis on behalf of the Canadian Club of Toronto and Equal Voice. Noella? Thank you, Helen. I'm extremely proud to have the opportunity to thank Francis Lankin for her inspiring remarks today. There is absolutely no question in my mind that she would be an inspiration to any woman considering entering politics, because she's so clearly the kind of person that we need more of in Canada. Frances is truly a well-deserving recipient of this year's EVE Award, and I would like to congratulate her again for it. I'm always happy to see women like Frances recognized, and I believe that her accomplishments speak for themselves. But the fact that we still need to promote women in politics is a reminder that we haven't come as far as we'd like to think we have since that day in 1929 when the Privy Council finally admitted that women actually were persons. But every time I hear a woman like Frances Lankin speak, every time I think of the career she has had and the contribution she has made, I comfort myself that we're indeed headed in the right direction. Frances, thank you and congratulations on behalf of the Canadian Club and Equal Voice. Thank you, Noella, and thank you all for being with us today for our third annual Women in Public Life Luncheon. And we hope to see you all again next year. 
On your way out, please stop by the Equal Voice table for more information on this remarkable organization and show your support. This meeting is now adjourned.